Well, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to, to talk a little bit about naturopathic oncology. Uh, I've been doing, I'm a naturopathic doctor. I've been practicing for a little bit more than 30, 30 years. And uh, I had about, I've probably seen a little bit more than 100,000 patients so far, uh, 100,000 patient encounters. So uh, I've, been, I've been doing this for a while. And uh, what drives me on always is to always get better. <clears throat> so before we start, uh, a few things. I want to make sure that I make the statement I don't treat cancer, I don't cure cancer, nor do I diagnose cancer. So then you wonder, well, well why are you here? Why are you even talking? I thought that's what we're, we're doing. I thought we were going to treat, we're going to cure, and you're going to diagnose me. I do none of those things. What we do do is that we support cancer patients. Patients come to us that are struggling with cancer. And we help people that are under the care of a medical oncologist or have completed that tr their traditional course of treatment. So I, I have many patients that come in and they uh, have done everything that a medical oncologist can do. And there is nothing else for them to do. So then they come and seek me. I mean, sometimes I've, I've had patients that uh, given three days left to live. Um, and that sometimes is a little bit of a tall order. Um, but it is amazing what can be done if you support the body in a proper fashion and you understand some of the processes that takes place in the body and you give the body what it needs in order to move back to normal operational health. We also have patients and to desire to maximize the impact of their traditional care. The issue with the traditional care is that, well, we, we declared the war on, on cancer uh, many, many, many years ago. Uh, President Nixon, he said that this is something that we're going to beat and we're going to cure cancer. Uh, we're still fighting that battle and we're fighting it with the same kind of weapons that we did at that time with the same kind of results. Uh, sometimes you would, you would think that that is the definition of somebody that's not very bright. So from my point of view is that we need to do something in addition to. It doesn't mean that the tools that traditional care are using are useless. It just means that we need to add something to it. We need to do something in addition to. And the tools that we offer are then tools that will enhance the impact of traditional care. Not take away from it, but to work along with it. We also have patients that come in that want to then reduce the negative impact of traditional care. I mean, we all know what chemo can do to the body, what radiation can do to the body. And we want to make sure that we support our healthy cells we have a whole lot more healthy cells than we have cancer cells. So we want to make sure that we take care of them, because obviously if they're healthy and strong, the likelihood for them to succumb to cancer is less. So if we strategize and create a plan to support all the healthy cells, then we are able to then contain the enemy, contain the cancer more efficiently instead of allowing it to spread into areas and making the battle much more difficult. So it, it's just like fighting a war in a distant country versus fighting the war in our neighborhood. You know, we want to make sure that we keep the cancer contained and, and we, we can attack it in such fashion instead of allowing it to spread all over the place. So supporting the healthy cells becomes an important strategy. And I, we have patients that come to us and want to focus on longevity and wellness. Uh, there's no ifs and buts about that chemo and radiation will shrink a tumor. I mean, it's going to do that every day, all day long. And it's very effective at it. But the issue becomes after you shrink the tumor. You want to make sure that you 
allow that patient to continue living well and reduce the risk of recurrence. And doing that, you need to then support, again, the healthy cells, support the immune system, and also support the body in such a fashion that we can then create that longevity and that wellness. So it's not all about killing the tumor, getting rid of the tumor. It is important to understand that cancer is a systemic disease. Even though we, we get so cancer or tumor focused and we look on that growth and we think that that is our enemy right there, but we have cancer cells that are circulating throughout our whole body and that tumor is continually trying to communicate and, and trying to evade and increase its territory. So it is important to make sure that we uh, contain that and look upon the body as a systemic body, as a wholeness, and, not that the, and the tumor exists within that environment. So we want to make sure that we create an environment for the tumor uh, so that it's very hard to proliferate and it feels isolated and it feels alone. We also have patients that come to us that, wants to, that want to address the root causes. A tumor does not just become because it wants to become. There's always a reason behind it. We may not be able to figure out every possible reason, but we can then, if, if somebody has been working as an auto mechanic, been exposed to a lot of chemicals day in, day out, or somebody's been a hairdresser, spraying chemicals all day long, or somebody um, has very kind of strong genetic line, or you, you, you can, after a little bit of digging, you can then find out why is that cancer there. And when you then get an understanding of what some of the root causes are, and you address those, you have less likelihood of that kind of fuel feeding the cancer. Doesn't mean sometimes that getting rid of the root cause will get rid of the cancer, even though the root cause fuel the cancer. But what you want to do is that you want to get rid of the fuel and then at the same time also be able to address the cancer in itself, the tumor in itself. So those become parallel strategies. <clears throat> so what we do offer at the Carl Fell Center, we, we offer cutting edge naturopathic cancer therapies you know, designed by some of the leaders in the field. So this is not something where we're just kind of sitting uh, in, our, you know, in our own little room and we're figuring stuff out for our own self. This is something by communicating with leaders throughout the world, Europe, South America, Asia, and seeing what works best, and then bringing that in as a solution for the patients that are under our care. And we are continually striving to get better. Does it mean that we never fail? No, we do fail doesn't mean that we increase the likelihood of an individual to not fail. From my experience, we do. And I want to get better at it, and I strive every day to get better at it. Uh, we had, I've seen many, many, many cancer patients. I had uh, one individual I remember, uh, this was probably 20-some years ago, pancreatic cancer. Um, he could barely walk, you know, came into the office and uh, failed cancer patient. And I, th I think within a couple of weeks, he was up fixing his roof, full of energy, you know, feeling great. Everything was, 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 was amazing. Um, and he, he felt great all the way till he died. But instead of having died, probably I, th I think they gave him a few weeks, um, he lived five years with fantastic life, great energy, and so that was something that we that were able to do 20-some years ago. And since then, I've, I've gotten better. We've gotten better, and the tools out there are better. And that is what's so amazing, is that it's a whole network of people like me 
that are continually researching and trying to get better at, at solving this issue. And it is outside the paradigm of cutting, burning, or poisoning. Doesn't mean that those don't work, but by themselves, we're not achieving much better results than we did when we declared war on cancer. <clears throat> so we, we have myself at the cancer, at the, the Carl Fultz Center, doing this for 30 some years. We have Dr. Iacoboni, you just heard him speak, almost 40 years of experience, uh, 100 some, 100,000 patient encounters as well. Um, we also brought in another team member, uh, Dr. Mikowitz. She worked with the uh, Natural Cancer Institute for 20 some years. Uh, so we have her as a backup for research. Uh, she's a PhD. So if, if we need additional, uh, additional research, she'll jump on it and then give us you know, what, what is the latest and what's a, what she thinks would be a, a great ad for that individual. And we have a large number of therapies under one roof. We offer a lot of options. It's not just here, take this one therapy, and that's all we got, and hopefully we can run with just that one horse. Uh, depending on how each individual is responding, we can then shift therapy if we need to. And we have great flexibility just because we have so, much, uh, so many options under one roof. And it is an individualized care. It is focused on you. you it's not a conveyor belt where you, you say, I have this cancer, and then boom, 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 boom. These are the therapies that according to standard of care that you're supposed to do. Now, we look upon you as an individual, and we see how can we help you? What do you need? Instead of just focusing on what is the standard of care, I, I just see a face there, but I, I really don't care who you are because this is what the medical profession says that I need to do and I can't do anything else because then I'm liable and I can get sued and I can lose my license. So at the Carl Center, we want to focus on you as an individual and we have a great team to help you with that. So cancer, one of the reasons I'm focusing on, well, there are many reasons. You know, one is that uh, the medical profession is failing strongly in, in that area, so we need to do something better. It is the second leading cause of death, and it's actually, we're, we're starting to see it move towards almost being the first leading cause of death. Personally, uh, my father died of cancer, from colon cancer, uh, so I have a personal connection as well. And uh, this is something that I really want to work hard on getting better at. Uh, we have one in two men, one in three women, currently will develop cancer in their lifetime. I mean, this is, cancer is like the, the scariest word that somebody can hear when it, it is told you have cancer. So this is something that we really need to soften the blow you know, since it is moving forward so much and so many people are impacted. Yeah, one in four men and one in five men, women will die from cancer. So we need to focus our energy on it. So traditional cancer therapies, like I mentioned, we have surgery, radiation, chemo. That, that's pretty much it. So they don't have a lot in their toolbox to, to address this issue. And because it is such a, it is a big money machine, they, uh, they don't seem like, somebody told me that if we cured cancer medically, that America's economy would crumble. Just because there is so much money involved in the research, there's so many hands in that pot, that if we would fix it, and we would, then we would need to move on to something else. But this has fed so many people financially, that uh, there's a lot of interest to not fully fix it. So the traditional cancer therapies, I mean, here are some of the concerns. You know, obviously it destroys the immune system. So yes, you have tumor shrinkage, but then after you've gotten rid of your immune system, so you don't have the ability to kind of protect yourself for the second wave when, when cancer gets more active. 
it is cancer-causing. I mean, we know radiation is cancer-causing, we know chemo is cancer-causing, and surgery in some ways can be cancer-causing as well. And the chemo radiation, it focuses on the fast-growing cancer cells. So it, it can't really kill all cancer. There's no chemo that will kill all cancer cells. It, it, it doesn't exist. It will shrink it, but it will never kill all cancer cells. And especially the ones that it does not kill are the slow-growing ones. And it does not impact, in a positive way, the cancer stem cells. And the cancer stem cells, actually, they are there to protect the cancer. And you kind of look upon the cancer as, as a wound that never heals. You know, the body is continually trying to... Uh, actually, the cancer cells are, are using the immune system in a fashion so that it will promote its own existence. So the body looks upon the cancer as, as that wound, and we, we bring the immune system there to uh, you know, try to heal that area. But while it's trying to heal the area, it's actually promoting the cancer from, you know, promoting the, the cancer growth and also promoting uh, the cancer to metastasize and move into other areas of the body. So, and the cancer stem cells that are not impacted by chemo you know, when you shrink the tumor, you activate the stem cells So, uh, using chemo. So what you're wanting to do then is that you're wanting to silence the cancer stem cells while you're shrinking the tumor. And that's why where integrative cancer care becomes very powerful, is that you, 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 you use both worlds at the same time, the, the benefits of both strategies, and, and they maximize the outcome. <clears throat> and also, you have the issue of hypoxia. You, know, you, you need a oxygen use as a, as a deliver system for chemo for radiation. So if you have a, a tumor, and that tumor in itself, just because uh, the, the cancer cells are so hungry for oxygen and for sugar and four nutrients, they, they, they continually feed. So that area becomes deficient because there are so many mouths to feed. Because the hypoxia then becomes so great, especially at the core of the, the tumor, you know, the delivery of the chemo and the radiation is not very effective you know, at the core. Um, you're able to shrink the outside, but the inside, you're not able to really deliver the chemo and the radiation efficiently. So that's why you want to then use certain oxygen therapies uh, to be able to, to drive and, and support then the, the delivery of, of the cancer or the chemo and the radiation then to more of the core or a, a longer or bigger area of the cancer. And there you can use therapies like hyperbaric oxygen therapy becomes a very powerful tool you know, during, uh, while you're doing chemo radiation. Uh, so, talking about cancer, it, it has certain hallmarks you, that of cancer that we look at, and I know this is hard to, to read, uh, but there are essentially six hallmarks. Uh, there are a few that's been added. It has been uh, edited a little bit since then. But one of the hallmarks is then that the cancer cell, it, it sustains a proliferative signal. So, it, it continually supports its own life. So it and makes sure that whatever cell signaling that takes place, that it promotes cancer growth. And it also develops a system where it then evades then the body's natural ability to suppress anything that is going uh, out of out of proportions, that is, it's starting to evade too much, it's going too much. You know, the, the cancer cells figure out a way to evade those suppressors. Also, it's figure out a way using the immune system to uh, support the invasion and, and movement of the cancer cells, to get into other areas of the body, so it, to promote its own growth. And it's also been able to uh, make sure that it is immortal. And we're talking about the mitochondria and the, uh, 
uh, dysfunction of the mitochondria and actually bypassing the function of the mitochondria in order to be able to get energy, uh, it, by, by bypassing the mitochondria, it then stops the a, uh, apoptosis, and which then promotes immortality. And then also it, it supports then the, the blood supply, the angiogenesis, it, because it is so hungry, it needs so much sugar, it needs so many nutrients to feed itself, uh, because it has a very inefficient way of producing energy. It needs more blood supply, so it needs to send out signals. You know, one is called VEGF, you know, where it, it promotes then those, those, uh, the blood supply to feed the cancer. And then obviously, you know, resisting cell death, you know, which, uh, which is huge. So these are the, the six hallmarks of cancer. And one of the paradigm shifts that we should have had back in the 30s, we had a, a, a Nobel Prize laureate, uh, Dr. Otto Warburg, where he discovered the Warburg effect where the cancer cells behaves in a different fashion than a normal cell in how it produces energy. It has an abnormal metabolic pathway. So this has been around since the 30s. And med the medical system have just not utilized it, nor have they adjusted their care based upon this finding. So, come to find out that this is the, the most consistent uh, behavior of a cancer cell, is that it uses a different way to produce energy, where it uses a fermentation cycle where it ferments sugar to produce energy rather than oxidizing it, rather than using the mitochondria to oxidize the energy. It then will ferment it. And this is the, the most consistent behavior of a cancer cell that is different than a normal cell. So a cancer strategy, obviously if this is something that is the most consistent behavior, shouldn't you utilize that behavior and try to make that into a weakness? So what's interesting is that if you wonder, if you look at the fermentation here actually, uh, fermentation of a cancer cell, it only creates like two ATP. ATP is like your, uh, your, your energy coins, you know, that the, the coins that you can use for energy. And respiration using the mitochondria produces 38 ATP, you know, per glucose, and glucose is, is your little sugar. So you wonder why would this benefit the cancer cell to have such an inefficient way of producing energy. Well, come to find out that this process generates a, let's see if I can use this part, it generates this little kind of molecule here, or a little a chemical called lactate. And the lactate is key in promoting metastases. It's key in promoting the signaling that takes place that will then increase cancer survivability. So in addition to then bypassing the mitochondria right here, which controls then cell cancer death. So it, it bypasses the mitochondria, which means that now it's immortal, and it then goes into a cycle that produces a lactate that then promotes more cancer. So that is why going, moving into that fermentation cycle becomes so important for the cancer cell, for its own survivability. So strategy then becomes is that you want to minimize that impact. You want to reduce the production of lactate and you want to try to drive the energy through the mitochondria. So they, they did a little study where they, you know, obviously you have a, a normal cell uh, right there, and when it uh, replicates, it produces two normal cells. You have a cancer cell, it replicates, produces two cancer cells. And what they did is that they took a, the, 
the genetic material of a cancer cell in a normal cytoplasm, which means that the mitochondria was functioning properly, it was healthy, everything else was healthy. The only difference was that now you had cancer DNA, the, the genes was from a cancer cells. And it replicated, and it replicated in a normal fashion. You know, it stayed a normal cell, still with the, the cancer DNA, but the mitochondria in itself remained the same. And what's fascinating is that it's the mitochondria that helps to heal the genetic material. So if the mitochondria can remain the same, that cell has a chance to become normal. Then they did an experiment where they had an abnormal cytoplasm. You know, the mitochondria right here is unhealthy, but the, the genes, the genetic material, was from a healthy cells. That cell replicated and it became two cancer cells. So, the, just like Dr. Iacoboni was mentioning, the solution is not looking at the gene. The solution is not trying to figure out all the genetic abnormalities and how to adjust your therapies depending on what the genetic abnormality is. We spend billions and billions of dollars of trying to figure out how the genes become mutated and how we're supposed to deal with that. The solution, again, is in the mitochondria. Because if the mitochondria is healthy, it has the ability to heal the genetic material of, of the cancer cell. So, we're looking then at a mitochondrial failure, and that's why we're getting cancer. And that means then loss of energy, loss of DNA repair, and it gets to a point where that the genetic material becomes so dysfunctional that it starts to then produce something called oncogenes, and it starts to produce uh, components that then proliferate uh, cancer, moves cancer forward. So some of the naturopathic cancer strategies you know, one obviously becomes in a metabolic therapy. We want to support the mitochondria, we want to protect the mitochondria, we want to activate the mitochondria to minimize the cancer's ability to move forward. And to also make it actually vulnerable to oxidative therapy, which is the next type of therapy that we use. You know, oxidative therapy, and Dr. Iacoboni spoke beautifully about the oxidative therapy, how to kind of push the cancer cell that is already so oxidative within itself, push it a little bit further. So all of a sudden, you know, its antioxidant resources within the cell is not enough to deal with the fire that's inside, which will then trigger the apoptosis. So if you have, then the mitochondria that controls apoptosis, if you resuscitate it, and then at the same time, which, which then can trigger the cell death, and then at the same time you push the oxidative stress within the cell, then the signal goes then to the mitochondria strongly, which then will generate that cell death. And then immune system activation becomes huge, because obviously, we are dealing with the rest of the body as well. We can't just focus on that one little area. We got to make sure that the immune system is functioning well to protect the territory that is still ours, that is still not the enemy. And then we want to silence the cancer drivers, which also goes back to doing mitochondrial therapy, but also then looking at the uh, cancer stem cells, making sure that they're quiet, and they're behaving, and that's where all this additional care comes after doing the chemo, after doing the radiation. So people, one of the biggest problems is that we, we do the chemo radiation surgery, you're declared cancer free, and said, oh great, now I can get back to my normal life. The real battle becomes after. That's when you really need to buck down and, and get going. Because cancer is a systemic disease and it is a chronic disease. I had another gentleman uh, that came in, this was probably about 15 years ago, 
Uh, he had some, some cancer, again, failed cancer patient, um, and uh, wasn't given much left to live, and uh, uh, started some therapies, and, and he became cancer-free, full of energy. Uh, he, he did great. He did fantastic. And he was on the protocol. I was monitoring you know, four or five years later, and uh, he was he was moving. So he it was a lot of energy, you know, to move. And he started to, you know, because he was moving, he didn't have time to prepare food and didn't take care of, you know, how he was eating. So he was eating garbage food and stressing, you know, not sleeping, all of these things. And boom, the cancer cell, you know, cancer came again. You know, it, it flared up. So cancer is a chronic disease, which means that you should always maintain your health. You should never let down your guard and think that you can go back to behaving and eating and thinking the way you did that created the environment where the cancer could proliferate. Once you change environment, once you change your habit, and those are the habits that then uh, allowed you then to uh, survive healthfully. You should stick with those. So this gentleman, you know, felt it was great. Yeah, you know, no worry. Yeah, you know, he didn't see any reason why he should. You know, have. I mean, just this was just a a month of doing something different. Cancer returned. Uh, went to the oncologist. Hit him hard with with chemo. Uh, the day after he died. So important to make sure that you, once you change your lifestyle, it is important to keep that. It is a chronic disease. Uh, some of the metabolic therapies that we offer, DCA is one, polyMBA is another, fermented wheat germ extract, another powerful ketogenic. Uh, Jennifer spoke beautifully about that. Uh, metformin is another metabolic therapy that exists. So talking about DCA, it's, it's, a, it's a fun uh, chemical, and it blocks right here. So this is that produ production of lactate, you know, and DCA then blocks that step right there, which then stops the signaling you know, that promotes cancer proliferation. So it is a powerful chemical. It can be a little bit hard on the body in some ways, so, but it is a strategy that you can, you can utilize and bring in. Uh, PolyMVA. Uh, it does something similar. It works on uh, starting on the, uh, or kind of initiating the function of the mitochondria, kind of driving that forward. It's a alpha lipoic acid mineral complex that is tightly bound together. So it's not very reactive, but it's fantastic in turning on the mitochondria. Uh, so this is another strategy that's out there. I just want to uh, kind of go through some of the strategies that exist. Uh, here, did a, a study with, uh, with DCA and polyMVA. So you can see that them together work very well together. So they, they were using them together. Uh, and and that's, that's important because cancer is kind of, you need a multifaceted approach. You can't just take one horse and run with it. The, the cancer will outsmart, outsmart that horse. You know, you, you got to have a multi-pronged approach and address it from several different angles at the same time. That's why if chemo radiation surgery fails. It, it is, it's powerful in what it does, but it's just one horse, and the cancer, at the end of the day, will figure it out and overcome it and then move forward. So you got to deal with it from several different angles at the same time. So then you're looking at then combining therapies and how they synergistically work together. So what they did, you know, you had the, the quantity here of DCA. It's 100 millimolar and see the impact then of, uh, uh, of the cell survival of the cancer cells. Uh, this is the control right here, and you add a DCA, and that, that's what you got. And then you add a little poly-MVA, and you see it start dripping, you get 17% uh, less cell survival. 
you add more poly MVA with the same amount of DCA, you get 63% uh, less, and then you have even more poly MVA and then DCA, you have 93%, you know, which is you know, a, a huge uh, reduction in cancer cell survival. So, um, yeah, anytime you see a, a graph move, that's usually a good thing, you know, whatever you're trying to prove. Um, so it's, it's just showing that when you do things synergistically together, you know, yes, I know a lot of people that read, well, I take this mushroom and they think that that mushroom is going to cure everything, or I take this you know, nutrient and that's going to cure everything. And even though they may be good and even though they may have helped a lot of people, usually combining them in the proper fashion, in an educated way, that allows you to have a better strategy and a better outcome. So this was just an example. So, and this, just a few cases. <clears throat> so here, uh, you have a gentleman. So these are a few failed cases. So this, this is not myself that, uh, that did this. This is a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Paul Anderson, uh, did a lot of studying uh, for uh, National Institute of Health with integrative care. So they added, they did poly MBA and DCA. As I said, these were ones that couldn't do anything, tried all the chemo radiation and all these things. So uh, these were at the end of the rope. Uh, you had a 66 year old gentleman right here with non Hodgkin's lymphoma. And you can see here he had disease regression with the poly MBA DCA. Here's, here's another, uh, it's a five year old female, mixed acute leukemia. Uh, also disease regression. And these were, um, and here, okay, here's another one, uh, multi female multiple myeloma, also disease regression. Uh, here a, uh, a leukemia, chronic leukemia. Um, it had improved quality of life, even though didn't see uh, disease regression. Um, here's a gentleman with a metastatic melanoma uh, disease progression. Uh, this gentleman actually, the only, the biggest difference with this gentleman was that he did not do, uh, do the ketogenic GAPS type of diet, which means he, he really didn't care about what he was eating. He was just taking, you know, the, the poly MBA and DCA and that's all he did. So what's important with, when you're dealing with these type of therapies, you still got to have the foundation you know, and the foundation is your diet, what are you eating? That becomes your biggest drug, your biggest medicine, everything you put inside your mouth. Then exercise, like Dr. Yacoboni was talking about, it's a, it's a powerful oxidative therapy, and they've seen that the people that exercise more, move more, have more muscle mass, survive better. So being active, pushing yourself is key. If you are in pain, you can't move, can't do anything, try to at least walk to the bathroom one more time or walk to the kitchen one more time. Just try to add exercise. Movement is key. Then your mindset, your mind is, is an important component. So these are like the three main pillars that you always get to have as part of a therapy. And if you don't have those, then all the niceties, you know, all the IVs, all the supplements, they can't cover up for you not having that solid foundation. You gotta make sure you have that solid foundation and then you add these therapies to it. So, uh, talking about the ketogenic diet, which actually, after researching the keto diet, ketogenic diet, it impacts all the hallmarks of cancer. Not just one. I mean, you, you have uh, the medical profession, they spend billions and billions of dollars trying to just figure out how to reduce the angiogenesis, you know, how the blood supply to the cancer, how we can cut back on the creation of, of you know, new blood vessels to feed the cancer. Just that one component, they're spending billions and billions of dollars trying to figure out that strategy. When they find a drug, you know, and, and, and you take that drug and it helps in that area. But the ketogenic diet, which is in, in essence free because you got to eat anyway, 
it will then impact all those hallmarks, not just the one, not just how you produce blood supply to, you know, how the cancer produces blood supply to itself. It will impact, you know, the, the cell death component. It will impact uh, how it's trying to evade uh, growth or uh, uh, suppressors, uh, impact how it's uh, promoting its own growth. You know, it will impact all of those. A therapy that's essentially free. So here they, they did a little study. So here you have um, cells, cancer cells, you know, the amount of cancer cells. So higher up means more, lower down means less. Uh, this is time. So you have then the, um, how much glucose that is in the bloodstream. So high amount of glucose, sugar, means lots of cancer cells. And you go with a, with a straight blue right here. Well, it's not that straight, but you're seeing less blue glucose. You know, here you get 15. Less glucose means less cancer cells. Red, even less glucose, means even less glu uh, cancer cells. So then we add then ketones to that. Ketones are uh, substances that you can use to promote... Um, like if you're on the ketogenic diet, you, 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 you create ketones from the fat that you're burning because you're not eating much sugar. So now the body has to go to using fats for energy instead of sugar. So you can then, there are also supplements that you can add that, that gives you ketones. It's called exogenous ketones, like sodium butyrate is, is a common one. We, we have that at the office. You can get it on, online. You can, a lot of people carry that. But so we did the same thing, you know, where you had this amount of sugar in the bloodstream. You added ketones, and you see it dropped from here to here. So less cancer cell survival. And then you have this amount of glucose in the blood, and you added ketones, it dropped from here to here. And same here, this amount of glucose, and it dropped from here to here when you added ketones. So along with then eating a ketogenic diet, then adding ketones, it then will decrease the cancer cell survival. And looking at this graph here, this is less ketones, less, less exogenous ketones, and this is more. And it's the same thing here. You know, this is a control, cancer cell survival. And you see the more ketones, the less survival. And here's actually went down. You know, it, it became less. Here then, if you then uh, combine... Uh, yeah, they did, they did studies. This is a... Uh, Dr. Dominic Diagostino, uh, Diagostino he's, he's a big researcher when it comes to hyperbaric, you know, oxygen therapy, and also ketones. So uh, they were doing this study, you know, seeing here uh, cancer cell survival, and here's cancer cell death. So the more red spots in this area, the more cancer cells have died. Uh, the more spots here uh, means that the more cancer cells that are alive surviving. So you want none here, lots here. And so there, he, were, he was looking then at the different therapies. You know, here's a control. You know, nothing was done to the individual, so a lot of cancer cells still there and not very many dying. Then you added uh, just hyperbaric oxygen therapy. You, know, you, you see less cancer cells surviving and more of them dying. And then you did just the low glycemic or the ketogenic diet on, on its own. Uh, it's fairly comparable to the hyperbaric, maybe just a little bit more uh, cancer cell survival and a little bit less death. And then you did uh, just the adding the exogenous ketones here. You see there's, you know, same thing there. Uh, actually, it's quite a bit less than of the cancer cell surviving, uh, a little bit more death. But then you layered all those therapies together, and here you see much less of the survival, and you see much more death. And you can see these different graphs here. You know, here's the control, you know, this black line. And then the next line would be just the ketones, you know, the blue one right there. So you see that that is still less than the control, but the other therapies here seems to be better. Uh, then the next line would be the hyperbaric, just right there. 
And then here, uh, the red one would be the, the ketogenic diet. So you see that if you're going to do one thing, at least do that. But then when you combine all three, you, you see the impact here. So there's less cancer cell survival. So uh, again, the, the power of combining therapies in the right way. So what are some of the oxidative therapies uh, that we offer? Uh, Dr. Iacoboni was uh, talking about that at length. You know, we have the IV vitamin C, IV artisanate, you got the ozone IVs, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, you got something that's called the Hocket, which is a kind of an ozone uh, sauna. We got uh, vitamin C, K3 uh, combination along with the rest of that hyperoxidative uh, uh, therapy that uh, Dr. Iacoboni was speak is speaking so beautifully about. So those are some of the oxidative therapies. Uh, here, vitamin C, for instance, yeah, and, and that's, that's what's important to understand. Yeah, a lot of times when we come from a medical mindset, we think is a pharmaceutical drug, you need a pharmaceutical drug to really do something, to get something done. I mean, an herb, vitamin, that's nice, that's pretty, but does it really do anything? And then when you're dealing with something as, as serious as cancer, I want to get something really done. I want to hit it hard. You know, I can go after it with big guns, and these other things, you know, they really don't do much. And really not supported by studies, not supported by anything, just anecdotal evidence. But the truth is, is that there's a lot of research behind these therapies. And it's hundreds, if not millions, of patients have undergone, uh, undergone these therapies. So it's a huge amount of data that's out there in regard to these therapies. You just got to look. And if somebody says there's no research on it, it's because they're not looking. So uh, vitamin C. Yeah, producing it, what's called a hydrogen peroxide within the cancer cells. So it actually, it's already very oxidative in itself, so you add that oxidative stress into the cancer cell. And it's also very great for palliative care. Yeah, when, yeah, because while you're going through chemo radiation, there's a lot of issues that you're dealing with. So it helps to reduce pain, you know, ease fatigue, you know, increase appetite, and also raise platelets counts. You know, platelets is something that tends to dip quite a bit uh, while you're undergoing traditional care. Uh, and it's preferentially toxic to cancer cells. And it also inhibits then that angiogenesis or that production of blood vessels that support and the, the cancer. And it improves in the well-being of the individual and also decreases inflammation, you know, which is what the tumor uses to, for its own growth. So the vitamin C becomes a powerful strategy. You have artisanate IV. Now, artisanate is, uh, comes from an herb called wormwood, artemisinin, and they found that it's approximately about 100 times more toxic to cancer cell than a healthy cell. And it uses uh, iron in the cancer cell and oxidizes that so again, produce more oxidative stress within the cancer cell. A cancer cell is very hungry in addition to glucose, it wants a lot of iron. So there's a huge load of iron within the cancer cell and using artisanate will then create oxidative components within the cancer cell to kill it more likely than a normal cell. So that's another oxidative therapy that's powerful. And uh, the component dihydroartemisinin uh, you know, puts a lot of stress in, on the cancer cell in, uh, in itself. So you can go and, and, and research artemisia, artisanin, artisanate, artemisinin. Uh, these are different names for the same thing. Research out of PubMed, and you, you find a huge amount of research that exists on what this does in regards to cancer therapy. So it's just continuation of some things that artisanate do. Uh, one interesting thing it, is that it reduces excess estrogen and prolactin in breast cancer. So any kind of female hormonal, uh, artisanate becomes even more important when you're dealing with that. 
Then here is CK3. I'm not going to go into that any, any much more because I know Dr. Jacoboni has touched on that quite a bit. Yeah, it's, uh, again, putting that oxidative stress on the tumor cell, uh, and it's, it's beautiful at that. So different immune system activators, because we need to support the immune system at the same time. Mistletoe is a very, very powerful uh, supporter. It is something that's a standard of care in, in like Germany and, and uh, Austria while undergoing chemo, because the chemo will suppress the immune system. It is important for the immune system to be functioning when you're done with the chemo. So mistletoe uh, becomes an important component to keep the immune system going have other things like UVLRX, also low-dose naltrexone is something that a lot of uh, practitioners use with success. Um, and again, it is not that one horse will take you always to the finish line. You need to have a multi-pronged approach. <laughs> that becomes the key. So mistletoe injections, here's just sim some things that it does, modulate the immune system, inhibit an angiogenesis, induce uh, apoptosis, uh, and also inhibit some of the protein synthesis within the cancer cell, um, and uh, it, it improves quality of life in cancer beautifully. Uh, UVLRX, which is actually intravenous light therapy. Uh, here are some of the things. So you, you, you literally have uh, an optic cable that brings light into your bloodstream and it has a huge impact on cancer cells and immune system. And this, this is like the, the next level of care is using light and the healing aspects of light to, uh, for uh, disease, different disease pictures, you know, cancer being one of them. And here you see you know, uh, dealing with uh, pathogen deactivation, immune system stimulation, improves oxygen saturation and blood flow, increases ATP levels and promotes cell repair, which means that it's less likely to go into that state where it moves towards fermentation, which is where you know, cancer cells thrive and exist. Um, also uh, regulates inflammatory and the immune system um, and you know, restoring youthfulness and, and health. You know, we all need light. And here we can do it intravenously. Here is low-dose naltrexone. It uh, works on the uh, uh, opiate receptors, you know, which uh, allows, uh, and the cancer cells tend to have a lot of opiate receptors. So it just allows the immune system to attack and destroy the tumor. Um, so that, that's, that's an exciting, exciting therapy that's out there as well. Uh, then you can look at uh, the cancer cells in themselves, or the cancer, and see what kind of mechanism is driving that specific cancer. And this is what's beautiful with a lot of the naturopathic uh, oncology, is that these different natural uh, substances, they have different actions on the body. And you can actually categorize those actions uh, and then utilize them strategically depending on what kind of cancer you have. So for instance, if you want to restore ap uh, apoptosis, you know, these are then some components that promotes that. Like obviously we have chemo radiation, but also mistletoe, green tea, quercetin, curcumin, inodol 3 carbonyl, garlic, grapeseed extract, reishi, vitamin C, melatonin. So, so you have all these different natural substances that exist and they promote the apoptosis. And you can do the same as you, we were just looking at back here. Here we were just looking at the first one, but then you can look at all these other drivers of cancer and you can then see what natural component will help and, and what area. So again, what's important is to make sure that you just don't focus on the tumor in itself. You want to focus on the individual. So, and that's when you become then a person-based model where you look at all the other aspects where obviously, you know, surgery, chemo, radiation can be part of it, but you also have prayer, you have immune enhancement, you have a healthful diet, you have, you know, the vitamins and supplements, you have exercise, you have stress reduction, you have avoidance of toxins, you have meditation, you have emotional support. All of these components are important and impacts the outcome of the individual tremendously. 
So you need to have a individualized care, a person-focused model, rather than just get focused on the tumor and thinking that that is the enemy. You know, just like Dr. Iacoboni said, we, we have something that will cure everyone. You know, cyanide, yes, it will kill the tumor, but it will kill the individual as well. So we want to make sure that the individual, the healthy cells, the healthy individual stays strong while we also reduce what is abnormal. And that's why it's important to have a person-based model rather than just focusing on the tumor and become myopic. So with that, then, the individual, you know, the participant, becomes engaged in the whole process. And by having hope and engagement, it generates self-power, which also promotes a healthy immune system. Instead of just having the physician going after the patient, and the patient is kind of like you're dropping your car off at the auto shop and then hoping to pick it up fixed. You know, what's important is that you are part of the healing. You are part of the process. You cannot step out of that and just have something done to you. And that's what what's becomes important. So here, just kind of a, a let me see, a wrong direction. Uh, it's not doing it. Here we go. Oh. So here you can then see how you build on the foundation of healing. And, and there's a lot of components that you need to address. It's not just, again, going after the tumor. You want to have a will to live. I have patients that were doing all the right things, but they really didn't want to live. She really wanted to go to where her husband was, which was dead already. I know all her children wanted her to live, grandchildren wanted her to live, but she really didn't want to. So she was doing the therapies just to appease the family, but emotionally, spiritually, she wanted to go. So she went, and she was very happy about it. You know, her whole family was sad, but she was happy. She wanted to be with her, with her husband. So will to live is one component. Hope, personal autonomy, meaning that you feel you have control over your own life. You know, and that becomes very important again in that, that person-focused model instead of something that's just being done to you. You, know, you want to have mind-body awareness. So these are just different levels, and you see on top, not on the bottom, there you have conventional medical therapies to be layered on top of this foundation. So this would be what a sample protocol would look like. And if you want to learn more, you know, obviously you, you come, can come and ask us anytime. I have a radio show uh, and Health Made Radio that's on, on Sundays at 5 at 107.5 FM. You can also go to healthmade.co to watch some of the previous shows. You know, there's some amazing interviews that, that I have there of leaders throughout the world, not just people here locally. These are experts throughout the world that I'm interviewing on the show. Uh, you can also, to get some more understanding, you can pull up your cell phone and just uh, do like a text message. You just pull up an empty text, and instead of typing the phone number, you type 33733. And in the body of the text, you will type Carl Felt, which is my last name, and M, the letter M, as menu, and then hit send. And there you'll get some educational videos as well, and you connect it to our center. You can also go to, uh, I have a TV show, that's on, it's called True Health, Body, Mind, Spirit. Uh, you can watch it on Amazon Prime. So just do a search on True Health, Body, Mind, Spirit, and on Amazon Prime. And they're you know, interviewing some uh, leading experts throughout the world there as well, and talking about some very interesting health subjects. You can go to our website, you know, thecarlfeldcenter.com, and you'll have access to all of these, and also learn more about the different therapies. Uh, Thank you so much for listening, and, and what we're wanting to do is to have a little Q&A so that uh, both Dr. Yacobone and I will be up here so that you can uh, just ask questions, because I know after all this information, you, I'm sure you have a few questions. So.